Shalom, and welcome again to Seekers of Meaning, the podcast TV arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Adras. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as you know, these podcasts are designed to speak to uh, how our families and our communities are reacting to this wonderful revolution in longevity in a variety of ways that we are. And uh, one of the ways that um, we can explore is uh, our own personal uh, and congregational and communal response to the call of the prophetic voice. And to help us understand that uh, is uh, a welcome to Rabbi Joel Safin, uh, the author of this wonderful book, The Mitzvah on Your Forehead. The Mitzvah on Your Forehead. Joel, welcome. Welcome to Seekers of Meaning. It's very, very nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me and for this conversation. I'm looking forward to it. It's a very, very interesting book. First, let's let's get the logistics out of the way. The book is if, if someone wants to purchase this, get the whole of this. Uh, where does one do this? The Amazon bookstores, wherever, or all of the above. Amazon is fine. Book Baby is better, um, and they'll put up uh, how to find it later on. You have in this book. It's a variety of explorations, commentaries, stories that you've woven from your experience, from your rabbinic experience, and then sort of like the Rashi on your stories from a variety of different people, lay and rabbinic, um, covering everything from personal life, congregational life, social action. But I got to ask you this one question because I'm reading through this book and there right in the beginning, I think on page 37, is the story called The Wooden Bowl, which is one of my favorite stories. I've used it in sermons a lot. And it really does speak to our demographic of Jewish sacred aging. And, and actually speaks to this whole situation of ageism in America and the invisibility, um, what, what some people call the third person invisible, of sometimes when we get to be a little older. So could you just talk to me about um, that story, how it got into the, to the book and, and, and what, the, what the meaning of it is in the context of the misfit on your forehead? So the story of the wooden bowl is about a family and a grandfather. And eventually the grandfather can't live by himself. And so he moves in with them and they eat together and everyone's happy until after some amount of time, the grandfather can't handle his food so well. So he slops his soup and he spills things on the floor. And the family decides, you know, it's sort of messy and I'm not so happy having him at the table. Let's set up a little table for him on the side and we'll give him a wooden bowl and we don't have to watch him. And if he makes a mess, it won't be such a big deal. One day the father comes home and he notices his son on the floor with little pieces of wood seeming playing. And the father says to the son, what are you doing? The son says, well, I'm making a wooden bowl. And what do you mean? I said, well, when you get older, I'm gonna have this wooden bowl ready for you. So when you're not gonna eat at the table with us, you'll have a little table in the corner and you'll be able to eat there. Okay, what's the point of that? You know, your children are always watching. Watch how you treat the grandparents because that's how they learn how to treat you. Now, part, I, part of uh, the way that came into the book was a not infrequent occurrence where the grandparents may not be invited to a bar mitzvah. In this case, the grandparents didn't like anything. They didn't like the family, they didn't like the spouse, they didn't like Reform Judaism, they didn't like services, they didn't like the location of the synagogue, and all they would do was complain. So I told that story to the family and I said, careful here, right? If you decide that you don't like the way the grandparents are behaving, so you're not going to include them in the bar mitzvah, so just wait, because there will come a time for sure when you will do things that your children will not like, and you're teaching them to exclude you. Instead of that, let's find a way to include them, right? Maybe things will change in the process, who knows? But you have lots of friends and they will run interference for you to make sure that it's a happy, wonderful occasion. And in the end, the family did invite them and it worked out, I wouldn't say perfectly, but it worked out reasonably well. So um, I love the story and it really has tremendous amount of resonance in, in for our generation and for the society in which we live. The book the book itself, you sort of like, if I remember correctly, there's three major rubrics, correct? Yes. Uh, um, what are those three rubrics? Holiness in family life, 
holiness in community or in congregational life and holiness in the world, social action. Now you 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 are known. Uh, I think I can speak the truth here for being very very involved with social action. Um, as you read through this book, that that comes absolutely crystal clear. But I want to start at the big. What was the motivation for you to do this? And I, if I remember correctly, in reading this, your mom was a very was a very instrumental in perhaps planting the seeds. Uh, my mother taught us, my, me, myself, and my two siblings, that our place was with the vulnerable, and that if there was a chance to help or to walk by, we help, whether it was convenient and easy or not. Um, and I've really taken that to heart. Uh, you know, my siblings did also. I became a rabbi, and in a special way, um, put that into practice. I I wrote the book. To be honest, it was during COVID. And at two o'clock in the morning, I don't, I'm tossing and turning, and I can't think of anything that I haven't done already that I need to do, and anything that I don't need to do that I already did already too. And I'm an action person, and so what should I do now? And people had suggested that I write a book alone for many years because I'm a person of stories, and I'm always telling stories about my experiences, but I didn't want to write that book. I didn't want to write a book where every sentence starts with I. I did this and I did that. And in the middle of the night, it occurred to me that I could design the book in such a way that I wrote half the book. I wrote my experiences, and then I included people who were with me on the journey, who shared, who had a similar interest or a similar experience. So on one level, this is like, you know, I'm old. I was 78 then, 78 now. And you sort of look back on your life and maybe have a kind of closure, a kind of a record. Secondly, I imagine that maybe someday my grandchildren might be interested in what Zeta did in his life, and this would be a way to see it. But the ultimate reason was, and this is it in, uh, in the book, it's a quote from John Holt, you know, that if he can do it, so can I. So what I did in my own mind is not some magical thing. I don't have some special talent or ability. I saw needs and I said, okay, I'm going to try. Let's see if we can do it, especially together with my congregation and with my community. You know, you know the book, The Mitzvah on Your Forehead. Well, I think every person has that. And my, my examples, to a certain extent, encourage people to find it for themselves um, and then to act on it. Talk to me about the title itself, because, um, you know, the, the title is kind of cool, The Mitzvah on Your Forehead. Where, where, where did that come from? Okay, so originally, originally, it came from a, from a passage in the Talmud in Shabbat, right? Where these rabbis say, can I get a special reward because I always had three special meals on Shabbat, because I had special devotion and prayer. I mean, they did all the mitzvot, one assumes, but they had like specialties, right? And the, and the collection where I found that titled it Mitzvah Specialties. All right, so I started to think about how people could have mitzvah specialty. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. I'm speaking at a men's club um, where I was sabbatical rabbi, and they say to me, okay, big social action rabbi, tell us what you're doing. All right, and I talk about how we had done a building project in New Orleans. And a person in the back is raising his hand wildly. He said, this, this is not q and I'm just telling you about my experiences. And he won't stop. And I had just explained the mitzvah tattooed on your forehead. And he says to me, I finally, okay, what do you want to say? He says, I'm going with you to New Orleans. I said, you know, I don't need any more people to go. I'm not asking for more people to go. I already have a lot of people. He said, I don't care. I'm going with you to New Orleans. I said, okay. And why are you saying that? And why are you coming on so strong? He said, it's the mitzvah tattooed on my forehead. I said, okay. And how do you know that? He said, I'm a carpenter. I worked on a lot of office buildings. I don't think I did anything that was really special or important. I'm going to New Orleans, whether you like it or not. When you find the mitzvah tattooed on your forehead, nothing stops you from doing it. Did he go with us? Of course. Was he the first person after that build to say, when's the next one? And the next one and the next one? And he became in charge of the actual working of the builds. There was no stopping. 
I like to think in a certain way that I have a mirror and I hold it up in front of people and then they can see it right here. All right. When they see it, they'll know because they'll have to act on it. Nothing you know, will stop them from doing it. The title of the book was almost the mitzvah tattooed on your forehead, which is the way I talk about it. But in Judaism, we're not so big on tattoos. Right. So I didn't want to alienate anybody before they even open the book because they don't want to deal with tattoos. You don't want a big mem on the forehead and uh, you channel <laughs> your inner golem or something. Um, and I, I, I thought, is the co the picture on the cover of people uh, pushing the wall up? I guess it's, it, 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 well, is that from the Katrina uh, expedition, the, the New Orleans? No, it's from, an, it's from an earlier one. Okay. You know, and the experience here, I mean, one of the important things for me, I don't know anything about building. I'm the least handy person you could find. I don't know which end of a hammer to hold. All right. So on this build, they say to me, do you do framing? And I say, well, you know, we don't have a house yet. You're worried that I'm going to frame the pictures. What are you talking about? I had no idea that this picture, that's framing. When you lift up the walls, they're asking me if I would do it. That's how little I knew about this. And yet I'm the one who had the inspiration to do it, who got everybody together, and I did all the human relations and solved all the problems. But I, I'm still not a builder at all, but I'm there with people. I mean, a woman once called me up and said, you know, I heard about this bill, but I don't think I can do it. I'm 60 years old. And I said, you know, I'm 65. If you want to do this, you could do it. We will find things for you to do, not a, not a problem at all. And over the 13 builds, hundreds of people have been part of this. The other thing I would say is people describe it as a build. I describe it as an experience in Jewish religious living. Because in the morning, we do prayer. Then we work all day. Then we study Torah at night. And I said to them, we don't work without the rest of this. All right. On one build on Friday, I decided, you know, we're going to go to services Friday night. So maybe we won't do the prayer in the morning. We'll just do it at night. And I say, okay, let's go. No one moves. They say, no prayer, no work. On the very first build, I asked them on Sunday night before we started, why are you here? The person says, I'm here on a dare. No one believes that I could actually do this. Second person says, I'm here because I don't believe you could build the whole house in five days. You know, I, I just, I have to see that for myself. Third person says, I'm here because it's a cheap vacation. <laughs> okay, fine. Monday morning, we're on the build, the newspapers come, and the TV, because they can't believe we're doing this, and they, and they talk to me, then I say, no, not just me, ask anybody you want. So, all right, they go to one person, they say, why are you here? The reporter is not Jewish, all right? The participant says, you know, you know what a mitzvah is? M-I-T-Z, explains the whole thing. I'm doing it because it's a commandment, and I have to be here. Next person says, I'm here because this is where God expects me to be. This is the miracle of this kind of work. And it happens so quickly that people get the higher purpose here and that this isn't a build. This is holy work. So are you still doing the, the, the builds? Uh, <laughs> I think I've aged out of, run I might go on one, but I, I've, it's a huge amount of work. Um, to put, I mean, we might in some bills get forty people coming from around the country. Right. So it's more. It's just more. And I retired, so I don't have a secretary or an office or any support really at all. One of the great quotes in the beginning of the in the beginning of the book. There's a couple I want to. It is by uh, Jeffrey Ullman. Uh, he writes: "The test of true belief is the extent to which we are prepared to act on what we say we believe." even at the risk of personal loss. I read that and I'm saying to myself, this could be an anthem for 2024 uh, and where we are in not only this country, but Jewishly and globally. Um, how do you understand that wonderful quote? Because from reading the book, this really is your life. I mean, my, my sense, I'm, There'll be no surprise to you. I'm a liberal. My community was conservative. So you can imagine what happens. People would say to me after a sermon, you know, I love the way you put everything together and the way you talk. I just disagree with everything you say. 
Right, a person says that a bar mitzvah and the portion is Noah, and I'm talking about violence, and I'm talking about gun control. There's a whole row of people going like this to me. At the end, I say to the father, Bar Mitzvah, what is this? He said, well, I didn't tell you, but I belong to the Rod and Gun Club, and they're all here sitting in that row. Okay, fine. So he says to me, why can't you just talk from the Torah? Why do you have to talk about this stuff? I said, not a problem. Open the Torah. Pick any verse you want. This is what I'm talking about. So that there was a sense. I took stands in positions that they were not always happy with, but there was a sense that, okay, my job is to wrestle in public. Your job is to wrestle in private. If you don't like the positions I'm taking, go home and argue and figure out what positions yours are. I think Judaism has something to say about everything. And let's do it. Even in the social action in the beginning, the first thing, big thing we did, we resettled boat, uh, a boat family, the Lu family from Vietnam. And people said to me, you know, they're not even Jewish. You know, and they live so far away. You know, what do we care about them? Then we resettled six Soviet refusing families. And they said, well, you know, all right, at least they're Jewish, you know, but they're so far away. Why don't we care about homeless people in Morristown? And I said, okay, I didn't know there were homeless people in Morristown. Let's care about them. Yes, for sure. All right, so that the part of the magic of this, I'll tell it to you differently. I took the congregation on many trips, and there were people, sort of the regulars who were the most committed, who would sometimes say to me, you expect me to go on this trip to Ukraine, don't you? And I would say, no, no, I have no expectation of that. That's up to you. All I could tell you is first, we're going. Secondly, turn around. There are 50 people waiting online behind you. So you decide if you want to go. If you don't want to go, it's okay. You can go on the next trip to El Salvador or to Argentina or to Ethiopia, where I took people, you know, and, and that's fine. Then they would argue, well, you know, I don't like the politics of the places that you're going. And I would say to them, I don't see politics. I see hungry children. If there are hungry children, or there are homeless people, or people without water, we need to help them. If you want to argue politics, that's in a different room. I'll argue about that. But beforehand, we're going and we're helping. All right. Uh, people joined my congregation from 27 communities. They passed many synagogues to get to us. And the reason they did was that we walked the walk. It was exactly what Jeff said, right? That if you had a problem, and you came to us, we fixed it. Whatever it took to do, we did it. The whole community was organized as a caring community. So in the time I was there, we gave away 27 cars, free doctors, free lawyers, free apartments, free furniture, everything. If a congregant had it and you legitimately needed it, we made the deal. So then people were proud. This is what our community is about. You know, we do things that others may not do, because we need to. I'll give you one other example. We created an ethics committee. That was among the least popular things that I did in the congregation because they didn't want the roles. They didn't want ethical statements. And they kept saying, after we, the first one was the temple will not accept uh, Xerox materials that were Xerox on a Xerox machine that you don't own or that you didn't get permission from the owner. So as a result of that, the sisterhood representative left the ethics committee in protest. The brotherhood representative said, you know, I go through my life, I hear you in my head like everywhere. Now I can't even go to the Xerox machine and Xerox without having the sense that, uh oh, does the rabbi approve of this? We really lived by principles and values, even when it wasn't convenient, even when it wasn't easy. But the truth is really, that all of us pulling together, which they eventually knew was true, we could do anything. If we all pulled together, we, in the end, we had 500 families, we could, do, we could take on any project, worldwide project, as long as we pulled together. So I got to ask you this question because what you're just talking about and, um, and put on your, your contemporary community keeper, the, as you, uh, as you look at our contemporary situation, congregationally, rabbinically, um, my sense is there is uh, somewhat of a retreat on the part of some colleagues 
to stand on the Bema and speak about what you're talking about because they're concerned, really, really concerned about some of the negative reaction that could bounce back on them from various political factions within the congregation. Are you seeing this? Um, do you, have you seen a retreat from the power, what I call the power of the pulpit? You know, uh, my sense is that the old style sermons are not, they don't happen very much anymore. That it's, you know, it's often a Devar Torah, a, focus, a narrower focus perhaps on Torah values. But I will tell you, I live in Manhattan, and there are major synagogues in Manhattan that are way out in front, certainly about Israel. Uh, you know, I had people even then who disagreed about things. But I'll give you an example. What do you do on Yom Ha'atzmaut? Right? So I would say to them, on your birthday, do you want people to say, you know, you don't look so good this year. You really sort of slowed down. You know, do we really want to connect to Israel and complain about all the problems? Or do we want to celebrate another year of the state of Israel? So we called up everybody we knew in Israel. I got the religious school and we sang out tikvah and we wished them like happy birthday. And also that there could be a way for a solid foundation of commitment. All right. Um, I needed that. When we went on trips to Israel, we did what you expect from me. You know, we lobbied, we fought for reformed congregations, we went to um, battered women's shelters, we did all these social action projects, because I believe that that's what concerned, like family members do. When they see members of the family in trouble, they, you know, they help them. Um, I would tell you, I want to answer it slightly differently. Um, my sense is that every generation, but this more than ever, especially our cohort, they want meaning. They want value. They want purpose. You know, we're not done. I'm 79. When I was 65, I couldn't imagine that I would still be going at 79, you know, but I'm raring to go. I'm still traveling around the world doing my projects. And when I talk to people about the opportunities for meaning, the answer is yes, so fast. I will tell it to you in a different way. Uh, my foundation has no overhead at all. I run it and no one's paid, Every, everybody volunteers, the lawyer, the account, everybody. And we have never had a fundraiser. And in 18 years, we've raised over $2 million. Why? Because once I tell people what we do, they immediately want to be part of it. I'll give you an example. I'm uh, leaving Israel. And there's a young woman doing the security check. And she says to me, why are you here? I say, it's a DACA. She says, oh, come on, really? I said, well, I have this foundation. That's why I'm here. Check out my projects and helping to support more. Everyone's waiting on a long line. She talks to me for 15 minutes. At the end of that, she says, here's my name, my email address, and my phone number. When you come back, I want to be part of this. All right, I go to check my bags. They say, oh, you can't check in. Why? You don't have the security sticker. She forgot to put the security sticker on my thing because she was so excited about, uh, you know, about joining in. I give what I call opportunities for holiness. And when they're out there, people want them. I don't, I don't have to push or give sermons about it. I think they really want them. So my answer to your question, I mean, I went around in circles, but my answer to your question really is, that underlying these kinds of issues are basic Jewish values that I think we can all agree on. Next is listening. I learned sometimes the hard way in all these projects how important listening is. I would say, which many people I know disagree with, that the people you disagree with the most that you can barely talk to, there is a grain of truth in what they have to say. And I want to find that. And I want to legitimize them as people. Then we can have a conversation. Doesn't always work. Can be very frustrating, but um, sometimes it works. And it puts me in a place that where I want to be. I don't cross people off because they have opinions that are unimaginable to me. You know, they're still images of God, and I want to make a connection. If you were back on the Bema now, given what's going on in Israel, would you be preaching or leading or participating in food drives for the vulnerable people in Gaza? So first, 
I would be in Israel already three or four times. And I would take people from the congregation because we have to be there. We have to see it and we have to feel it. Second, um, you know, people donate money to the foundation. Sometimes it's because they like what I'm already doing, but sometimes they have their own ideas. All right. So the most recent case, the biggest donor I ever had, she says to me, I want to feed poor, uh, hungry children in Gaza. And I say, okay, fine. Hungry children. Okay. That's fine. Um, could we also feed poor, hungry children in Israel? All right. She says, okay. I find ways to do both of those, and she doesn't want to do for Israel in the end. She doesn't do it very nicely, but she sort of withdraws from me and does the connection in Gaza on her own. Okay, that's fine with me. Feeding hungry children is, you know my philosophy here. Well, am I worried about what's happening in Gaza? Yes. And my heart is not hardened there. Or could there be justifications for what Israel is doing? Yes, of course. It's not a simple thing. But if there are people who are going to starve, my heart is with them, especially children. If there are ways in which we could help them, I would want to do that. Yes. Even if it wasn't popular. Yes. I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be surprised that, that I would talk to them. What is the, you, you mentioned twice the foundation, which uh, Jewish helping hands. So, um, why don't you talk? I, I, I want you to talk a little bit about that. Uh, what is it? What does it do? And how, if somebody wants to get involved, how do they do that? When I was retiring, my parents, may they rest in peace, died when they were 60 and 62. When I was 61, I retired. Um, people said to me, what's your plan? I said, I need to have a plan. I'm going to die. I'm not going to live. And now 18 years later, and I, was, I, I interviewed with everyone I could think of to find social action work, nothing. One day after Shabbat morning services, a Kyrian says to me, you look sad. What's the matter with you? He said, well, you already hired my successor. That's good. You know, I'm the type A and I don't know what I'm doing. He says, maybe we could find a way for you to keep doing what you've been doing here, all right, by creating a foundation. Would that be okay? And I look up and say, thank you, God. Would that be okay? Yes. In 2005, that's how the foundation got started. All right. In the beginning, it was kind of an extension of the projects we'd done in the congregation, but it got to be much, much bigger than that. Um, what we focus on are immediate needs. Some people would call me the Band-Aid guy. I, we don't lobby. We don't change the system. Somebody needs to do that. I'm thrilled people are doing that. But in the meantime, people are suffering. So we find, imagine this way. The American Jewish World Service goes to a community. Imagine the community is a pond. And they plop down in the pond and they take up almost everything, but not everything. There are all those people on the periphery who don't meet their criteria, who don't fit in, who can't apply, whatever. Those are my people. Right. So we send out and uh, uh, we send out a call for proposals around the world. Last year, we got 1,250 proposals. We got 500 proposals from Uganda alone, where the whole country seems to know about us. So we have had water projects, we've had um, latrine projects, we've had microloan projects. Uh, it's nice to, for it to be self-sustaining, but it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, the philosophy is we find partners. I don't run any projects. I have partners in many countries that I trust, and I travel around and meet them. I go to East Africa twice a year, I go to Israel twice a year, and I have people that who I trust to go and vet out other projects. Um, so we're in East Africa, in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Ethiopia. We're in Israel. We're in Central America. We're in South America um, and in the United States. Uh, and, and part of the beauty of this, I'll tell it to you differently. So some of the young people who grew up in my congregation said to me, we want to be part of this but we don't have any money and we can't travel. So what can we do? I said to them, all right, I'm gonna create it for you. I'm gonna create a committee, the grant making committee, which is mostly people who now they're like 40, who grew up in my congregation and who vet what all the projects are gonna be and who are a part of it. Now that some of them have money, they also donate you know, on their own. Um, 
the other beauty of this, so who's in the foundation? The secretary is my former secretary from the temple. All right. The vice president and the treasurer are former members of the congregation. So we have a kind of informal understanding. If I'm in a community and a need appears, I can just say, here's money. I could just say, I can vet that. They, I mean, I wouldn't give them $20,000, but you know, smaller money, I can do that. So we are on the ground in the moment. Every penny that's donated to us goes directly to help people. I'll give you one example. In Rwanda, if a woman comes to give birth, the hospital does not provide food. The family is supposed to provide food. If you don't have a family, if they live far away, if it's an emergency, the hospital gives you cereal, no protein. If you gave birth by cesarean section, you cannot heal without protein. I'm the protein guy. What does that mean? In three hospitals in every year, we provide eggs and protein for all the mothers who need it and don't have it. 18,000 mothers a year, the cost per mother, $2, $2. Now, when people hear that, I don't have to go to, like, to a restaurant and say, don't have dessert, you know, and give me $50. It's $2, you know, tiny, tiny money um, in these countries makes a huge difference. So, so that's again, a good spirit. So the, the foundation is Jewish Helping Heads, how does somebody connect with you? How, is there a website? Because I'm sure people will want to follow up. JewishHelpingHands.org. Very simple. That's the website. If you connect through the website, remember there's no overhead. If you right. connect through the website, you know where it goes? To me. Okay. Everything on the website comes directly to me. Um, and, I, and I answer and I respond you know, as well as I can. There are people at any kind of interest in helping in this kind of direct way. I think we we probably have 25 projects, um, all kinds of uh, needs, direct needs that we are trying to meet. Uh, before we run out of, start running out of time, is the, I mean, the, the book is filled. And again, we're talking with uh, Rabbi Joel Sopin, the author of uh, The Mitzvah on Your Forehead, Book Baby, uh, Amazon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Tell me about the $26 Messiah. <laughs> We're coming up to Passover, right? Okay, so there's a teaching in Judaism that you're not allowed to walk past a person asking for help without giving help. To uh, make sure that, and I live in Manhattan where there are people everywhere, I don't leave the house without a lot of dollar bills. Whenever I see a person asking, I give a dollar bill. Some of these people, now I know their names already and I've connected them many times. Sometimes I've said to them, how much will it take to get you off the street today? And I will give more money if that, I hope that that's what they'll use it for. All right, so one Passover, I realized that we have no children and we give prizes for finding the Afikoma. So I want to find that something to give. So I decide to go to the BJ, a B'nai Jeshurun office, synagogue we belong to, to get a cookbook. All right, it's like two o'clock. The office closes at three o'clock. The Seder is that night. I am just about running to get to the office to get the cookbook. I pass a person who says, will you help me? I say, on the way back. I pass another person, ask me, I say, on the way back. Then somebody says to me, do you have $26? I'm like, 26? Are you kidding? $26? This is the first person I have ever seen asking for money with a kippah. He's sitting on the curb with a kippah. I say, on the way back. And I'm like, I can't figure this out. I go to the office. The cookbook is the wrong thing. I come back. And now I'm searching. I said I would see them. I find the other two. I cannot find this guy. And I'm thinking, 26? What's to, what is that 26? Well, it's the numerical value of a name of God. yud hey vav hey. Right? You add that up, 26. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, on Passover, there's a test. A poor person comes, right, knocks on your door. You open the door. He says, you know, are you going to let me in? All right. In effect, I said, Come back later. And if I had reacted the right way with the prophet Elijah, who knows what would have happened. So instead, I tell the story. That's a great story. And um, it's, it's apropos for right now and, and for the holiday coming up. Rabbi Safin, thank you very, very much. Um, I, I wish you continued success. I wish you, more importantly, continued good health. Uh, thank you. And to you as well, to all our listeners.
and to uh, 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 Aziz and Pesach to you and your family. Again, Rabbi Joel Safin, the author of The Mitzvah on Your Forehead, uh, bookbaby.com, I think bookbaby.com and Amazon, etc. cetera. Um, rarely in this world do you meet somebody who walks the walk. And I think you got a flavor of that from this conversation. So, um, and if there are colleagues out there who, you know, struggling or trying to figure out some some things for next program year take a look at this book i think you're going to get a tremendous amount of ideas and inspiration um to walk your walk no matter where you are in this country so thank you joel thank you very very much again really appreciate it thank you. to all of you thank My you pleasure. again for joining us on today's edition of, Se of secrets of meaning the podcast tv arm of jewish sacred aging we appreciate your time very very grateful for you sharing with us and um if you'd like to help support our work on these podcasts and Jewish sacred aging uh, as we search, as Rabbi Safin was talking about, of uh, our own sense of meaning and purpose in the third and fourth stages of our lives. Uh, go to the website, jewishsacredaging.com. You'll find a conveniently located donate button and just click on and follow the prompts. Um, if you'd like to be a sponsor to some of these podcasts, uh, please get in touch with me, Rabbi Address at jewishsacredaging.com. Seekers of Meaning is recorded at the Broadcast Center of Lubetkin Media in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and our usual shout out to the electronic guru, Steve Lubetkin, our producer. Thank you again for joining us. I am your host, Rabbi Richard Address, and until we meet again on our next Seekers of Meaning, take care of yourself, and most of all, be kind to one another. Shalom.